I could just start introducing myself. Some of you know me. I'm Laura Vukels. I'm the chair of the curatorial department here at the Hudson River Museum, where I am virtually sitting from my desk at home. Um, virtually putting myself back in the 19th century on the porch of Glenview Mansion. And uh, today we're going to be talking about flowers in Glenview as soon as everybody gets in here. Maybe you should unmute yourself, Victoria, so you can update me on the status. Our curatorial sure. assistant, Victoria McKenna-Ratchin, is my co-host today and she's letting people in. Oh, maybe more people are in and I just can't see the bar. Is that it, Victoria? Uh, so far, just um, on and off, some people are joining, but right now, everyone who's in the waiting room is in. Oh, they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll wait a couple seconds. But um, so you know, we're gonna. I'm gonna talk about uh, flowers in the mansion. It's a, a research project I've worked on for a number of years, and something that really fascinates me. And it's been a little bit of a mystery too. So I thought it would be. Um, you know, an interesting topic to kick this off. And uh, we're probably going to plan some more of these talks on specific topics. Just to give a little bit of background um, that some of you uh, may already know, uh, the Hudson River Museum is in Yonkers, New York, and uh, opened in uh, 1919 in City Hall, but then it opened in 1924 in Glenview Mansion uh, that this talk is about. It's right on the river. So this is the an aerial view of the uh, museum from a few years ago. Uh, some people know those trees aren't in our courtyard anymore, but you can see how the modern building that was built in, 18, in 1969 uh, surrounds the front of Glenview. And up on the third floor, that window over to the right is the window of my office. So this is a picture of the mansion in the year 2000 and a picture from 1885. The uh, Glenview was built in 1876 and 1877 and it was designed by Charles Clinton who designed uh, the 7th Regiment Armory and it, in New York City. Some people may have been in that building before. It's a similarly, uh, if you look at the general shape of the building. It's a rectangular building with a tower. Both of those buildings are, and there are a lot of other similarities. Um, and this picture was actually taken by the brother of Hudson River School artist, um, Albert Bierstadt, around 1885. The house is filled with flowers inside and out. And uh, this is a, a detail of that picture from 1885. Uh, and you can see little carved flowers uh, underneath and over the windows. And down below is a detail. This is sandstone, so it's worn away a little bit over the years, but you can see a detail of a flower there. Sarah Linda, do you want to say anything to anybody? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Laura's colleague, Sarah Linda. And um, uh, one of the things that's so wonderful about having Glenview as the centerpiece of our permanent collection at the Hudson River Museum um, is, in particular, these flowers that you see throughout uh, the rooms and uh, throughout the, um, the outside. And you can see that course of, um, of flowers, and, and we'll talk later about what Laura believes them or believed and now believes them to be, because that's the whole idea of this this talk is that it's kind of a mystery. Um, but one wonderful resource, uh, they, they, they form a wonderful resource for learning about so many different things. Um, the Victorians uh, were intent on bringing nature indoors. And when they did so, they transformed organic patterns into geometric patterns. So one way in which we use a house as a learning tool is uh, studying shapes and patterns. And um, those of you who are on this call who are docents know that very well. Um, and so here we have uh, an example of radial symmetry, um, which is from nature. 
and this was a um, a feature of the international aesthetic movement, um, as well as the arts and crafts movement um, that Laura will talk about a little bit more later, um, in terms of its um, how it was uh, how it kind of began in England and was practiced here in the United States uh, through the work of Charles Eastlake and others. So I already mentioned that uh, there's flowers inside and out of Glenview. Um, and then when you come inside, I wanna just run through a few slides to show people what the inside of Glenview looks like because some of you've been there and some of you haven't. So if you came into the house in the 19th century from the front door, this is the grand hallway. And uh, this on the right is a detail of the carved staircase. So I'm going to run through some of these slides of the inside of Glenview, and you'll get an idea of what I mean when I say that there's flowers everywhere inside Glenview. Um, these are some more details of the um, Great Hall. This is a pillar on the stairs and on the right there are some decorative columns in the Great Hall and so here's another and these are walnut and burl walnut and then there's stencils all over the inside of Glenview and this little detail up here on the upper left is a flower stenciled above the wainscoting in the Great Hall. And then if you come over here uh, to the fireplace, you see these, um, this tile of Guinevere by Daniel Cotier. And then all around Guinevere are various types of flowers on these uh, square tiles and even in the border around her. And then one of the amazing, most amazing things about the Great Hall in Glenview is to look up. This is a uh, stained glass, um, paint, stenciled glass lay light that we had restored about 20 years ago. If you can believe we didn't always have this view, uh, you looked up and you saw acoustical tile ceiling. And so we restored all this floral um, decoration of stencils. And you can see also these carved uh, sunflowers going up the staircase. Now, uh, when we go into the library, um, we see uh, even more flowers. And I wanted to just bring up quickly the notion that uh, Glenview is really related to a very specific stylistic period in the 1870s at a time when, um, when they were celebrating uh, 100 years of the US being a country, they had a huge World's Fair in Philadelphia called the Centennial Exposition. And a lot of the um, decorative arts that came from other countries to be displayed there influenced the decorative arts in the United States, especially some of the English displays. So on the right, you see an engraving of one of the English displays at the Centennial that was on the cover of Harper's Weekly. And then on the left, you see um, the library at, at, the, uh, at Glenview, and you can see how similar these fireplaces are with carved flowers and shelves around it. And um, it's clear, I think, that the people who were decorating the inside of Glenview went to this fair and were adopting some of these uh, designs. Uh, okay. So here are some more details of the woodwork in the library. Uh, you call this marquetry. It's sort of like inlay, but it's all applied instead of carved in an inset. And, um, and this is a corner of the, of the mirror on the fireplace. And these are some other details around the room. And in every room, you need to look up and you'll see all kinds of other flowers. This is the ceiling in the library. And the museum started restoring these period rooms in the 1970s. These were repainted by Rambush and they, they did a lot of, you know, uncovering paint layers and things like that to find out what they had looked like before. And then we go into the parlor at which I worked on this restoration project uh, in 1999 and you, you just see flowers everywhere. I mean, 
um, on the rug, on the upholstery, on the wallpaper, which there's three different kinds that have flowers, all over the stenciled ceilings. And we had photographic evidence uh, for restoring this room. And you know some of the details we couldn't see well enough in the photograph, like the rug, but we're pretty sure it was this kind of floral rug that they had. And here is um, a detail of the stencils on the ceiling, which include gilding and all different kinds of flowers. And some of it was stenciled and even some of it was hand painted, like the details of the, the leaves on this vine up here by the bird and the bird, those were all hand painted. Um, now, and then you go into the sitting room, which is a little bit more casual. And again, you find all the stenciling with the flowers and this beautiful bird's eye maple cabinetry and more flowers. So um, to get to the basic topic of the day, uh, we always called these flowers at the museum sunflowers. And there was reason for that. I mean, they look a lot like sunflowers, but also sunflower is a very emblematic and typical flower that was popular in the aesthetic movement of when Glenview was built. And uh, it was so popular even that people made fun of it. So here on the left is a trade card uh, making fun of Oscar Wilde and his devotion to sunflowers, saying, strike me with a sunflower. And that's from just a few years after Glenview was built. And then on the right, right around the time Glenview was built, you see a wallpaper by an English um, person from the arts and crafts movement named Bruce Talbert. And these are sunflowers and probably peonies, but the large uh, flowers, definitely sunflowers. And so we always, you know, even from way back before I came to the museum, called our flowers sunflowers. Then the first like crack in this uh, armor came in when we did our historic structure report in, uh, eight, in 1995 right before we did that big preservation project I mentioned, there was a whole study we did on the condition of Glenview and the architects described every little thing and they called our flowers daisies. And frankly, we were a little let down by that and we weren't sure we agreed with it because daisies seemed very, I don't humble. They, they didn't seem as grand. They didn't seem to have as much to do with the aesthetic movement. Here's a detail of the inner front door of Glenview in the Great Hall. And we just didn't want to think that these might be daisies. Um, but I, I started to do a little bit of research on it and William Morris did do a wallpaper in 1864 that was daisies and you know looking at some of the more modest and simple carved flowers in Glenview here's the great hall again and here's the library you might start to think that that they could be daisies it also wasn't as easy to to devote a lot of research to this back then before there were a lot more resources on the internet so we're talking, you know, late 1990s, early 2000s. Now, what really got me going though, several years ago was I was, I look at auction catalogs from time to time to keep up to date with things. And I saw this beautiful piece of silver uh, by Tiffany that was selling. And I thought, wow, sunflowers, cause I'm always looking for sunflowers. And then I read the caption and I saw that it was chrysanthemum. And I was really intrigued um, because I didn't really picture chrysanthemums looking like that where you could really see the center very well. And if some of you are more of a flower expert than me, you may be thinking, well, you should have known that, Laura, but I didn't know that and I got very intrigued. And the reason I was so intrigued is because the Trevors, Mr. John Bon Trevor, who built Glenview, I, I, when I got a little flustered at the beginning with our technical difficulties, I did not mention that the house belonged to John Bon Trevor. He was a banker on Wall Street and commuted back and forth to the city. And he was, uh, one reason he built such a big house on a huge property, uh, 26 acres, was because he wanted to uh, grow flowers and fancy trees and have very, um, you know, landscaped gardens and he had greenhouses and the family grew chrysanthemums. So here's a picture of the chrysanthemums and the greenhouse at Glenview. And here's, a, they were supposedly bronze. 
And so this is a picture of a modern chrysanthemum of the color I imagine these chrysanthemums were. And it's a color that's very prevalent in Glenview, a lot of these kind of tertiary colors. And so I thought to myself, uh, what if Mr. Trevor or Mrs. Trevor said to the designers, make me a house full of chrysanthemums. I love chrysanthemums. So all of a sudden, I started looking around at the decorative uh, elements of Glenview with a very different thought process than I had ever had before. You know, I was before just thinking, oh, how does it relate to other decorative arts, to English arts and crafts movement, to, to Eastlake, to, you know, other designers. I wasn't really thinking, how does it relate to actual flowers they might be depicting? And so I started looking online at pictures of chrysanthemums. And I learned in about two seconds, the way one does on the internet, that there are a lot of different kinds of chrysanthemums. And many, many kinds of chrysanthemums have prominently visible centers. Now, I didn't want to just take uh, the word for it of modern images because people are inventing new kinds of flowers all the time. So I also looked at older um, resources. I highly recommend Google Books. There's also another resource called archive.org where you can look at actual old you know, publications. It's not like how people say, oh, don't take anything, uh, the, you know, be careful of research on the internet, but so many things I access, you're just looking at the actual you know, original sources. So this is a book from uh, 1901, and it's actually a book about um, floral decoration for the use by artists. So it's not even just a gardening book, it's a book, and this is a pink uh, chrysanthemum looking very much like a pink daisy with a prominent center. So I spent a little bit of time uh, thinking about the language of flowers because that's really popular in the Victorian age. There's so many different sources for that. Um, you know, even just today, I was trying to remind myself some of the books I found these, uh, these meanings in. And even just in the 1870s, there's at least seven books on Google Books where you can read the whole text. And so they mean a lot. They don't always agree with each other, but sunflowers might mean pride and haughtiness and false riches, which was starting to think like a less likely flower I would want the flowers in Glenview to be. And daisies might be contempt for worldly goods which or simplicity. And Mr. Trevor was a devout Baptist. So I thought, well, maybe he would, maybe he would like that kind of a meaning. And then chrysanthemums were a little bit all over the place. They could mean cheerfulness under adversity or even slighted love. So this is all fun, but not really relevant for figuring out what kind of flowers are in Glenview. More pertinent are things I found like this, which is an 1873 uh, English book uh, telling uh, artists how to adapt natural decoration for uh, use in decorative arts. And it goes all the way back to Egyptian times, the, 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 the little medallion uh, on the left, furthest to the left, is supposed to be from an Egyptian tile. And it's sort of making a point that a lot of artisans believed in the late 19th century, that any kind of decoration you put on decorative arts or like walls or painted surfaces should be abstracted and should be symmetrical and very geometric. And they felt like that uh, was more pleasing to the eye and more appropriate, which always seems to me so proto-modern. You know, it sounds like everything you learned in art class that, that all the, the modernists believed that, that a canvas was flat and that the design on it should be flat. And um, so that I always think is very interesting. So they didn't think, that you should just make a, a painted frieze in a house and it should look completely realistic. In fact, in the Rococo period, uh, about 20 years before or 30 years before, you saw more of that. And these um, designers were feeling themselves reformed against that. They thought that was very ugly and disconcerting, that if you walked across a rug where all the flowers looked realistic, 
you would feel like you were like stepping on something that wasn't flat and you'd get disoriented or something. You know, that, that's just what they thought. Um, and then um, another source that, that I consulted, and the museum is lucky to own a copy of this book, which I, I think they may have purchased in the 1970s for research, is a book called Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament. And this English book from 1856 is just stunningly gorgeous. Uh, Owen Jones um, wanted to uh, make a tome that artists and uh, architects could look to to get ideas. And he, he did, um, I'll show you some illustrations from it, uh, copied illustrations of decorative arts from all around the world dating back to ancient times. And, and if you look at, um, you know, just on the left, these Middle Ages, uh, like these tile designs are just like tiles that are in Glenview. And then on the right, there are some um, designs from Nineveh and Persia that start to look just like some of the flowers in Glenview. So I think um, artisans were really uh, aware of this book and consulted it. This book, I can tell you, is massive. It's like 22 inches tall and, and must weigh about 15 pounds. Um, and then if you look down the stairs at, at Glenview, you see what I was talking about, that there's this tile floor that has a lot of similar the designs on it to what you see in Owen Jones. Now, during our technical difficulties, I neglected to say that uh, if you wanted to type some questions in the chat feature, um, that Victoria would be looking at that and we would stop halfway, as it says here, pause for questions. Has anybody asked any questions, Victoria? Not yet, but I made a little comment just saying that people should ask questions through the chat. If people know, t uh, tell them where the chat feature is. So sure. if, if they want to do it. Sure, if you hover over your screen, at the bottom there should be an option to pull up a chat. You just click that and then you can type a message and send it off to everyone and we'll see it. Yeah, and if and I if nobody has typed any questions yet, I won't pause long here. But um, just uh, be aware that at the end we will stop again and see if if anybody has asked any questions or comments because a lot of you may know much more about flowers than I do, even though I've read a lot at this point. Um, it, in fact, uh, one thing I um, didn't mention uh, when I was back on this slide is that one of the interesting things I learned about chrysanthemums uh, and immediately is that chrysanthemums and daisies and um, sunflowers are all from the same family of flowers called Asteraceae, which comes from the word star, but they're also called composite flowers. And what that means, and it's easiest to see in the one on the left, is that the center of the flower is actually all tiny, tiny flowers, like a zillion tiny flowers. Each little piece of the center of the flower is a flower. And actually the parts that we also think of as the petals of the flower, each of those is an actual flower. So it's called a composite because it's actually like one flower made of many, 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 many flowers. And daisies and chrysanthemums and um, sunflowers all have that in common. Now, um, we throw around the word East Lake a lot when we're talking about Glenview. And so I wanted to just for a moment mention who that is. Uh, Eastlake was an architect and a curator in England and also a furniture designer, although it's unclear how much furniture ever got built that he designed. But he's most famous for writing a book called Hints on Household Taste that was published uh, in the 1860s and then went into a zillion editions, including in America. Uh, he was giving advice on how to have good taste and people thought that 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 really had some importance, uh, they thought, that if you were surrounded by tasteful 
uh, furnishings and art, that it affected your moral character, and that um, is a very Victorian idea, and that you would even bring up, you know, better children if they lived in a in an artful household, and so you know, people really and Americans love advice books. I mean, even now, think about it. Even now, when we're all holed up in our houses, people are watching cooking shows on how to bake their bread and all different things, and how to make their masks. So people loved this book, but if you also just look for a second on the left at the illustration and you see all kinds of little decorations on this cabinet and some of them are floral. And this is um, a sideboard in uh, Glenview. Not all of the furniture that we display today is original to the house, but this is one of the pieces that is. And it's by an, uh, a cabinet maker named Daniel Pabst who did all, as, as far as we know, uh, he did all of the woodwork in Glenview, including this and all the mantel pieces and the staircase and everything. And so um, I want you to look at this hardware and I'll show you a detail in a second. There's leaves and flowers all over the wonderful hardware, all over, these are little, uh, the top band at the very top is a little row of flowers. Um, and uh, this is a detail of one of those doors. And the reason I show it compared to this illustration is this is an illustration from East Lake's book. So we actually know that Daniel Pabst was reading East Lake because he copied his design of Aesop's fable of the fox and the crane right from the book. And then you see these little flowers on this is a curtain design and there's little flowers also all over um, the design of the sideboard, especially here. So this is one of the, the outer doors and you see this flat carving. Uh, and I mentioned that the sort of a flat abstract design was, was very popular. And you just get a closer look at this magnificent hardware. And also, uh, I'll come back to this center design in a minute to make a point about the flowers, because the next thing I tried to do is I tried to think what clues I might find in these abstract flowers that might point to whether the artist had anything in particular in mind, what kind of a flower it was. And so I remembered uh, that daisies have sort of the lobed leaves and I found out that sunflowers do too. So on the left, these are sunflower leaves. And then on the right, you have, uh, no, on the left, I mean, chrysanthemum leaves. And on the right, you have sunflower leaves and you see how different they are. You call this an entire leaf on the sunflower and it doesn't have these lobes like on daisies and chrysanthemums. So I went back to look again at these uh, flowers and uh, on the left again we have the sideboard on the right we have the stairs and um, so you know I one thing that happened that was weird about the stairs at first I thought and I'm just going to tell you to think about something before I tell you because once I tell you you won't be able to unsee it in the two flowers from the stairs what do you think you're seeing on the sides of the central flower now, I always thought, you know what you think, you just thought it. I always thought they were leaves. And I looked at them and I thought, oh, maybe those are the lobed leaves. They're very abstract, but maybe those are lobed leaves and this would be a, a, a chrysanthemum. And then I said that to one of my colleagues and my colleague said, um, oh, well, no, I always just thought those were sideways flowers. So if you type something in the chat, tell me if you thought these were sideways flowers or if you thought they might be leaves. So, um, but then when I looked again at the sideboard, which as I said, it's by the same person, it seems like you have sideways flowers and you have leaves. And these leaves on the, in the flower, and you have some, a forward flower on the corners, and then you have these sideways flowers and you have leaves and they definitely look like lobed leaves. So I thought, well, I don't know, maybe these flowers on the sideboard might be chrysanthemums. Um, okay, now, uh, 
there might be different kinds of flowers because now we're back in the library and I started looking at the leaves and these are entire leaves, not the lobed leaves in this little detail from the library. So I decided, I thought, well, these might be sunflowers. And chrysanthemums were really popular in the period as well. So it's not like I was moving from a flower that everyone thought was emblematic of the period to one that wasn't. And this is a William Morris wallpaper from right around the time of Glen Butte that has sunflowers on it. And they're sunflowers that look very much like those Tiffany sunflowers. I'm not sunflowers, excuse me, chrysanthemums. They have the centers showing somewhat and the, the outer petals curving in towards the center. And um, so th there was this. And in our sitting room, in fact, and I, here's the overall again, if you look up at the freeze, it, that is chrysanthemums. And we've, we've always known that this one part of the decoration in Glenby was chrysanthemums because it's, it's pretty obvious. And um, in this room, uh, when I look at this freeze, I'm always reminded that one of the other uh, influences from the Centennial exhibit that was very popular were, um, were uh, the Japanese displays. And if some of you may remember, there was a long period of time that the West didn't really have much contact with Japan, but the U.S. Uh, sent Commodore Perry over there in 1853 and fairly much forced their hand to begin trading again with the West. And so, uh, suddenly like Japanese decorative arts were wildly popular and started to be seen in World's Fairs. And when they came and they had a huge pavilion at the Philadelphia World's Fair, it was the first time a lot of people had even seen Japanese art and they just went crazy for it. And so um, the uh, chrysanthemum is a really uh, popular flower in Japan. And I want you to notice here too in this little um, sort of geometric design that's winding around this frieze and also the shape of the leaves and also these little things that look like berries, which I think are little flower buds. That will come back. And then this is another page from Owen Jones, which shows a Chinese decoration that's, that's very similar, makes you even wonder if, um, the designers of that uh, stenciling, which were Leisner and, Lewer, Leisner and Lewis, if they had seen this before. Now I mentioned, uh, besides uh, being emblematic of Asian art, specifically Japanese art with the chrysanthemum and the imperial seal of Japan is a chrysanthemum. And when it's very abstracted, it looks like that one on the right. I just got that off Wikipedia. And then on the left, and this is not in our collection, um, is a textile that features a similar chrysanthemum in Japanese art. And again, with, with a center uh, showing as part of the abstracted design. And the Trevors, oh, this is some little glitch on my screen, this red thing. I don't know what that is. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, Anyway, these are some cloisonne Japanese uh, metalwork in the museum's collection. These particular examples did not belong to the Trevors, but the Trevor family did collect Japanese art. In fact, they bought some at the Centennial exhibit. And you see some different kinds of chrysanthemums, particularly the ones people call spider chrysanthemums. And then on the, the neck of the vase on the right has a more abstracted one closer to the shape of the imperial chrysanthemum. These are some pieces of Kangxi uh, Chinese uh, porcelain in the museum's collection. And even though they're from around 1700, this type of blue and white porcelain was really popular for, um, for Victorians to collect. Mr. Trevor collected it. J.P. Morgan collected it. In fact, the one on the right belonged to J.P. Morgan. Also Rockefeller collected it. Um, and you see a lot of chrysanthemums on this type of porcelain. So we're in the, the, the home stretch now, back to the Glenview Mums, which were actually called Glenview Mums. So this is what the mount of the, uh, the original photograph looks like. 
and um, <laughs> gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stop to try and fix that, but I do apologize. So um, I mentioned that Mr. Trevor bought the property and bought this house so that he could cultivate the grounds. So this is the oldest photograph we have of Glenview, probably from right when they were moving into the house. And you see the planting bags on the left. And, and uh, if you notice the background behind me, just, just 10 years later, uh, this is what the view out the porch would look like when all these things started to grow up. And um, I meant, uh, the Trevors had one gardener when Mr. Trevor was alive. He died in 1890. And then the second gardener was Howard Nichols. And these photographs I've been showing came into the collection from the Nichols family. Um, and so these are the greenhouses that they had and they had hotbeds. And in the hotbeds, they were growing violets. Uh, violets were one of the, um, Mrs. Trevor would enter flower shows with uh, Howard Nichols helping her grow these flowers. And he was involved like in the Yonkers Horticultural Society and they want, would win trophies for these violets. Here's another view inside the greenhouses. And, um, and back to chrysanthemums, chrysanthemums, and their affiliation with Japan, with Japan made them really popular. And they just, there was such a resurgence of interest in chrysanthemums in the late 19th century, um, even though they'd been known in the West for a few centuries, that they would have whole shows that were just chrysanthemums. And this is a picture of a chrysanthemum show at the New York Horticultural Society in 1886. And, um, so people just uh, loved them. And even now at the New York Botanical Garden, they have a chrysanthemum show every fall where they have a whole room filled with all different kinds of chrysanthemums. And uh, Mrs. Trevor and Howard Nichols actually won trophies for their flowers. I think these are for roses, not chrysanthemums, but these are in our collection donated by the Trevor family. And here's the view that's behind me. And this is a scene from around 1900. Emily Trevor, the daughter, they were both named Emily, out on the lawn with her nieces. Uh, can you imagine bringing this uh, Asian carpet out and putting it on your grass to have a picnic? But that's what they're doing. Um, so one final thing, back to the parlor. And uh, this on the upper left is the photograph that we were using when we restored uh, the parlor. And you see uh, the sheen on the wallpaper. This is a wallpaper with a metallic background. And, and so we had a very good picture that we could blow up to get um, you know, the wallpaper right. And so here's a, you know, blowing up the historic picture of the wallpaper. And this is a detail of the wallpaper as we, we recreated it. And so I want you to take a look at the leaves and take a look at the little buds all around uh, on the branches. And I have definitely decided at, at the end of all this research that the wallpaper in the parlor is chrysanthemums. Uh, because it has the right kind of leaves. It has these little buds. And then when I went to the chrysanthemum show at the New York Botanical Garden, I also saw sort of vines of chrysanthemums that had little buds on them, even though other flowers were blooming. And we don't know who um, made the original wallpaper for the parlor, but we think that it was either designed by Bruce Talbert, who I mentioned before, for the American market, or just highly influenced by him. So the, the happy ending of my story is that last year, I decided after all this time invested with this research that, that got me so fascinated, I went on eBay and found a copy of one of the Tiffany spoons to buy for the museum's collection so that we would actually have one of the pieces in our collection that inspired all this research about the flowers of Glenview. So um, 
thank you for going on this journey with me today. Uh, are there any questions or comments, Victoria? So uh, people really thought this was a fascinating topic, which is great. I'm really happy to see that. Um, also, there was a comment that the details by the grand staircase in Glenview that they look a bit like lilies as well, the side views. Oh, and are they thinking that it's two different kind of flowers, like one flower is a lily on the side and then the other? Um, I mean, lilies were certainly very popular. If you go back to, um, I think it's in the, the stenciling in, no, somewhere there's definitely fleur de lis, maybe not here, but um, definitely lilies and various kind of fleur de lis are, are really popular at the time, particularly in things like, um, like all of these kinds of designs that are used on these tiles are fleur de lis. So, yeah, that's a thought. Anything else? Um, someone was wondering what the we would think the expense of keeping up the gardens was at that time. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know, but that's a really, really good question. I mean, the Travers were certainly wealthy, but this is, and I, I haven't done a thing where you've tried to translate it into modern terms, but this is one example I, I give to give a sense of their wealth. When Mr. Trevor died, the estate was worth about $12 million in 1890. But 30 years earlier, when Cornelius Vanderbilt died, his estate was worth $116 million. So, um, but yeah, I'm sure that there was a a good deal of expense because I don't know as much about the flowers, but when the um, museum was first taken over by the city of Yonkers in the, in the 1920s, um, they also, there was a cottage that, they, so they had, uh, Howard Nichols was there and he had a whole cottage down where in Trevor Park, there's now some tennis courts and so, I mean, he had a whole household. So the Trevors were, you know, besides having 11 servants, were putting up a whole household of a gardener on their property. And, um, yeah, what was I gonna say about that? Uh, and, oh, and so that, that house became the office of the Parks Department for Yonkers. And they did a survey and found something like 85 different species of trees and shrubberies on the property at Glenview, some imported from all around the world. So I think that Mr. Trevor was sparing no expense in um, manicuring uh, the lawn, although in a sort of a naturalist kind of way, not a, not a, not a regimented type of ornamental garden, you know, like in France or, or in the Persian gardens up at Untermeyer. Uh, park, a more natural kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think he, and, and even um, where, where the Untermar Gardens are, the house that used to stand there was Greystone, and the first person that lived there, uh, the second person that lived there was Samuel Tilden, the governor of New York, who had run for president against Rutherford Hayes. And Mr. Trevor actually advised him on his gardens walked around with him and advised him on his garden. So I, I think, you know, it was a huge avocation for Mr. Trevor and followed up by Mrs. Trevor, who entered many, many flower shows. I mean, it's pretty easy now with the internet to find some of the listings of all the flower shows she was entering in some of the awards that they got. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, um, so on a similar vein, uh, we were wondering, was, would a gardener, as in the position, um, be considered a menial position or one of the uh, important, especially to a I have a feeling it depended on what you were doing. I mean, um, the first gardener, uh, John Whiffler, uh, his family, I've talked to his family before, um, and they own a gold watch, like a solid gold watch that Mr. Trevor gave him for 25 years of service. It's gorgeous. 
And so, you know, Mr. Trevor certainly valued him very highly. And at the date that's on the watch, it's clear that Whiffler was already working for Trevor before they moved into Glenview because 25 years hadn't gone by since they moved into Glenview when he got that watch. Um, and, and plus, you know, it was a nice cottage that they lived in. I mean, that was a nice um, little residence that they had. It was listed separately on the censuses and stuff. But then um, I think probably uh, Nichols had assistants you know, and those I think would would not have been, and, and also uh, to give you an idea too, um, like Howard Nichols was, you know, being really involved in all the, like the, the uh, horticultural societies of which there were several in the early 20th century in Westchester and Yonkers. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that was considered very, uh, gentlemanly activity. But then like the picture with the hotbeds and the gardener there tending them, I don't think that's Howard Nichols. He probably had assistants. Great. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions, but people are really appreciate and really love this presentation. Um, okay. Well, I think we're probably going to do one again. I don't think we have it scheduled yet. Uh, but, you know, we might do one on the woodwork and more about Daniel Papst, or we might do one about um, the kinds of costumes that people, you know, clothing that people wore during the period uh, that Glenby was lived in, or even on the music uh, that the family listened to and how they incorporated music in their home. So just keep following the museum on social media and looking at the calendar, and um, then you can... Uh, see when we'll do another one of these things. Well, so thank you, everyone. I, I guess I will uh, sign off, but thanks for coming. <laughs>